chapter 10. I'm going to continue on from where we left off last time. We finished with verse 14, where Paul had given this plea to flee from idolatry, which is just that way of uh, having a false view of who God is and what he does. And uh, it all fitted in with the different examples that we were given of the children of Israel. So we're moving on from verse 15 this evening. Verse 15 says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh. Are, they, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice... They sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Amen. We pray God will bless his word to our hearts the same Odd ending on a question, but we'll continue that next week, God willing. Just as we look at these verses, and uh, the, the title of thought for this evening was a faith for troubled times. Because whenever Paul is talking here, he's talking about all of the, uh, the, this whole issue of things sacrificed unto idols. And he's really introducing what he's going to deal with in the latter part of this chapter. Uh, and it follows on from the examples that were given of the children of Israel and their idolatry and their murmuring and everything that they did in the wilderness that we were warned against. Uh, and he's really honing this down now into a, a practical application for the Corinthians of that day. One of the things that uh, happened very much in Corinth, whenever food was being sold in the area called the Shambles, uh, whenever it was being sold there, it had first been taken and presented to one of the false gods. It had been offered as a sacrifice, and then it was taken from there down to the market, and that's where people bought it. And there were many of the Corinthians had a big problem with this, because they thought that by taking that meat, that it was in some way contaminating them in a spiritual sense. And that's what Paul is starting to deal with here. Uh, and it's how to live out this faith in troubled times when there's so many things around us that are wicked, so many things that could contaminate us in some way, uh, and things that we think might contaminate us. How do we handle those things? How do we deal with them? And that's really what Paul is dealing with here. We need to remember as well as we're reading through this that we're coming very soon into chapter 11. Dealing first of all with head coverings and then into uh, coming to the Lord's table. And some of what's being said here will apply directly to, especially to the issue of the Lord's table. Uh, whenever we come on to that as well. As you can probably imagine from verse 21, there's a lot of overlap there. And it's leading into what Paul is going to be dealing with. But I want us to see first of all sensible faith. In verse 15, I'm going to spend a wee bit of time just in verse 15 alone. I know it's very short. But he says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. This word wise just means prudent, sensible. I'm speaking to you as people who know how to think, people who have rational thought. You can think something through. Now, apply that. Use that rational thought that God has given. Use that sense that God has given and apply it to what we've been talking about. And he says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. Think about what I've said. We often say that the Christian faith is a reasonable faith. Whenever we think of what uh, Paul wrote in Romans, that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. It's the reasonable thing for us to do, to present ourselves to God. In Isaiah, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. We are reasonable people. We are rational people. We have the ability to think. We don't always use that ability very well at times. Sometimes we use it very badly. 
and we're all guilty of that. Uh, but we are rational beings. We have the ability to think. Uh, and Paul is just saying here, apply the reason that God has given to you. Now, in what ways should we be thinking? Well, let's turn, look at a couple of references just to see some ways that we should be thinking. First of all, in chapter 2, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 12. And he says here, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto, unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. We see similar words being used here as Paul has just been using in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The, the idea of judging all things, about discernment. And that's really what Paul is talking about. He's talking about thinking spiritually. Thinking spiritually. We are to use our reason along with the Holy Ghost that God has given us to think spiritually. Not to think carnally. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 6, Paul says, For to be carnally minded is, dead, uh, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so if we want to enjoy the eternal life that God has given us, if we want to understand that life, if we want to have peace in that life, even in these troubled times, the only way to have that peace is to think spiritually. And so whenever we're thinking of the election that's taking place, and we're soon going to be hearing early results uh, from that election in America, uh, and, and we look at all the things that are going on, and, and we see the cheating, and we see the I saw one woman who received 16 ballots at her address, all in different names. You know, that's the kind of thing that's going on. And you look at this and you sort of think to yourself, is there any possibility that you could have a, 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 an actually reliable result out of this? And humanly speaking, probably no. But don't forget what Daniel said concerning God, that he is the God who raises up kingdoms and brings down kingdoms. And if Kamala Harris wins, then God is giving America what they deserve. If Donald Trump wins, he's also giving them what they deserve, but also maybe what they need. They need someone who will at least have policies that are good. But it's all in God's hands. And whenever we accept that and, and we accept that God has a purpose in this and that he knows what he's doing and he knows the end from the beginning, we look at what's happening and we say, well, we know what we want to happen, but whatever happens is what God wants to happen and that's going to be good because that will fit into his purposes and plans and that's going to bring glory to him. And so we have to think spiritually. But then we also have to think eternally. Look at First Peter, please. First Peter chapter 1. We'll see how I get on with this. I might not get much further than this verse tonight, but <laughs> you'll not be surprised. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be God, sorry, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, 
Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You see that Peter is bringing our attention to eternal matters. The things that are going to last. Because we can so easily get caught up in the temporal and, and in the time based. And in the temporary things of this life. We can get so caught up in the things that we see around us. And that, that's part of this carnal mind. It's, and it's natural for us to think like that. You know, we are natural beings. We are fleshly material beings. Everything that we sense. We use something material to sense it. With our eyes, we're using eyeballs and the nerves and the brain. Uh, with our ears, we've got the wee tiny bones and wee hairs and, and everything else. And everything that we sense, we sense with a physical body. And yet, we who are saved are also aware from time to time of that spiritual realm. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. I'm sure you have. But if you drive somewhere where there's very little gospel and where you know that there's very few members of that population believe in the Lord. Do you feel a darkness or a, a, an oppressiveness, a heaviness almost as you go into it? I've experienced it going up the falls, for example, and you know that it's held in the darkness of Roman Catholicism. I've experienced it down in Cork. One year I went down to help John Nixon with CEF one week and, and I was out with him in his caravan. This caravan had uh, dents and slashes in it from everything from hurling sticks to axes. And he even had a shotgun pointed at him uh, while he was teaching the kids in this caravan. That's the kind of darkness that was there. And it was down at the time when there was a pilgrimage around the city to all the different points that are representing the ascension of Mary or the assumption of Mary. But there's a, such a darkness, spiritual darkness about it. And it's not just in Catholic areas. You go into some loyalist areas and you get the same kind of a feeling. We're aware of that spiritual dimension, but... Not all the time. That's why we need to train our minds to think about eternal things. To think about the things that aren't just temporary and aren't just happening now, but things that have an eternal perspective. And if you just use the election as another example of that, whoever gets in is going to be there just for four years. If they live that long, <laughs> the way things are going in America, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what's going to happen. But it's for four years. And everybody's getting worked up about what the next four years are going to be like. Folks, we might not even be here in four years' time. We could be with the Lord. There might not be a president in the White House. There might be an antichrist ruling over the world by that stage. These are eternal things. All part of God's eternal plan. And we know that the things that we experience here and the things that we get worked up about here and the things that we worry about here, and it's, it's good to, to have a, a sense of what's happening and, and to, to be aware and to put things within context, but we're not to get so oppressed by them that it starts to bring us down because we're going to leave it all behind. The bad as well as the good. And we're going to something as far greater. And so Peter is talking here about looking beyond, looking unto the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And we haven't seen him yet, but we love him. But we believe in him, even though we haven't seen him. And we're rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory now. Remember that, at the end of that verse we sort of think, yes, we're, whenever we see him we're going to be filled with joy and speakable and full of glory. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that you haven't seen him yet, right now you're rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's what God has done for us with salvation. That's part of this eternal mindset. So we're to think eternally. We're also to think carefully. I've got a couple of references for you this evening. Matthew 26. You know something? We'll do something a bit different tonight. I'll put you to work. 
Right, we do this with the young adults. So if somebody would get Matthew 26, verse 41, all right, and you can read it out whenever you get it, and then somebody get Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Okay, so Matthew 26, verse 41, and somebody else, Ephesians 6, verse 18. So Matthew 26, 41, first of all. Okay, so we've got a familiar verse there, a lovely verse as well, but a, a challenging verse. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation, the temptation to do things according to the flesh, the temptations to do things with a carnal mind, the temptation to look at things in a, a temporal way, not an eternal way. We're to watch, we're to pray, but we're also to watch our walk, we're also to watch what we do, we're also to watch how we think that we enter not into temptation. Ephesians 6 verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all sins. Watching thereunto with all perseverance. See, it, it, whenever we're watching, whenever we're looking at what's happening, we can get overwhelmed, but we need the perseverance of God to keep in mind that eternal perspective, that spiritual perspective, but we're to watch what's happening in the world. We're to be prepared whenever we can sense an attack coming from Satan. It's good for us to be up on what's happening in government. It's good for us to be up on what's happening within our classrooms. It's good to be up on what's happening within our local council areas or what's happening on the media. It's good to be aware of the trends that there are in our society so that we can be prepared to present the truth when these attacks come. To present the truth to those who don't have the Holy Spirit of God to set off alarm bells in them. We have the Spirit of God setting off alarm bells in us when we hear about these things. Uh, but there are many in the world who don't have that. They are not saved. They don't have the Holy Spirit. So we need to be prepared to speak the truth to them. Watching what's going on. With all perseverance, it's tiring and it's exhausting work. But God never said we were going to get it easy in this world. He said it would be difficult for us. Our rest hasn't come yet. It's coming. But it hasn't come yet. And so we need to watch with all perseverance so that we can be prepared to tell the truth and to stand for the truth. It says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And the more we see us approaching that end, it's not that we should be getting scared or frustrated or anxious about the things that are happening. What does Paul say to do? Be sober, be sensible. And watch unto prayer. Bring it before the Lord. And pray that God would do a great work in these last of the last days. As we see this time approaching. And so we're to think carefully. We're to be watchful as we apply the gifts of rational thinking that God has given us. Then we're also to think patiently. We know that uh, those couple of verses after the roll call of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and in, verse, in, in chapter 12 and verse 1, having gone through all of these righteous people, all these people of faith that have been brought before us, some named, some unnamed, the, the writer to the Hebrews, and you're going to say Paul there, I might be right, but anyway, but the writer to the Hebrews says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed with, about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand 
of the throne of God. But look at verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. There's a patience in endurance. It's not just about putting up with discomfort. And it's not just putting up either. You know, some pe- sometimes people think about endurance as just having to bear it until it passes. That's not biblical patience. Because the writer to the Hebrews here puts running alongside patience. So there's activity. We're striving. And whenever Paul is talking about running the race, he said that he runs this race and he is reaching toward the mark, pressing toward the mark. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Or the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. So again in there we see the aspect of running the race combined with patience. Knowing that the upward call is coming sometime soon. And again in, in Hebrews chapter 12 the same thing. Because we have this writer saying let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And then what does it say about the Lord? It says... Who for the joy that was set before him. Now have, has he reached all of that joy yet? In a, in a time perspective. I know that, that he is eternal. He doesn't experience time the same way we do. But we're looking at it from our perspective from time. From our perspective. Has the Lord yet experienced all of the joy that is set before him? Well no he hasn't. Because from our perspective, there's still people to be saved. And there's still that joy that he will have when all of the saved are gathered together as one to meet him in the air. And we're transformed and we see his face and then we're brought as a bride after the judgment seat of Christ. We're brought as a bride pure and spotless before the Father, presented perfect. That's the joy that he's anticipating. That's the joy he was anticipating at the cross. The joy of bringing those that were born in sin and damned for hell. The joy of bringing them into glory. And it's still to happen. And we're going to be there. We're part of that joy. And we haven't experienced that joy yet. But it's going to be such a joy for us as well. And so we run with patience. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto what he's looking for. Looking for that wonderful reunion with him. That ought to thrill our hearts. And ought to keep us faithful as we seek to be striving for him. Paul talks about it a little bit as well in in Romans chapter 8 and verse 25. He says, but if we hope for that we see not. Then do we with patience wait for it. There's something we haven't seen yet. We haven't seen the best that God has planned for us. And so with patience we're waiting for it. But as we wait we're striving. As we wait we're working. As we wait we're running with patience the race that is set before us. And then we've seen that we're to think spiritually. And we're to think eternally. And we're to think carefully. And we're to think patiently. And tied in with that patient thinking, there's this expectant thinking. So I've got a couple more verses for you. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. We'll get somebody from this side. Okay, so you get 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And somebody from this side over here then. Uh, Psalm 62 and verse 5. Okay, so over this side, 1 John 2 and verse 3. This side, Psalm 62 and verse 5. Okay, we'll have the first John reference first. Don't be shy. (laughs) First John. Yes, I might have given you the wrong verse. Sorry, it's chapter 3 and verse 2. <laughs> you know, for the first time in a long time, I'm using handwritten notes and I knew you'd get something wrong. <laughs> Sorry, chapter 3 and verse 2. Okay. You want me to read it? I forgot my That's okay. Yeah. 
Amen. That's the right verse. Mm -hmm. Amen. I was like the buses. We got two or three at the same time. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> now are we the sons of God. And what does he say? It doth not yet appear what we shall be. Hear the confidence in that. What we shall be. Not what we might be. What we shall be. We're going to be changed. We're going to be made into something brilliant. But we know that when he shall appear, we, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We're going to see the Savior someday. Does that get us excited? Does it get us excited to put a smile on our face? <laughs> There's a challenge. <laughs> Especially in Northern Ireland. But that's our anticipation. That's what we're expecting. Remember that there's a crown of life that awaits those who love his appearing. A crown that awaits those who love his appearing. Are we living with that expectancy? Because it's that expectancy that the Lord wants to see in us. That's, what the, that's who the crown is for. And if we're living with that expectancy, what a difference it's going to make to our lives. Psalm 62 and verse 5. Well, that sums it all up, doesn't it? You know, we're not waiting for what America is going to give us. And we're not waiting for what Kemi Badenoch might be able to give us in a few years' time. Uh, depending on how long care lasts. And we're not waiting to see what Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israelis are going to bring for us. We're not waiting for any of these. We're certainly not waiting for the UN. We'll be waiting a long time. But we're not waiting for any human. We're not waiting for any man-made structure of any kind. We're waiting for the Lord. We're waiting for what he has for us. And what he has for us is going to be wonderful. Uh, and, and over and over again in scripture we have this constant reminder that we're to be expectant. We're to be ready. We're to be looking. Remember whenever we were thinking about the trials and suffering. We were thinking of Romans chapter 8. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That verse 19 just means that even creation itself is waiting for the time whenever we as the sons of God are manifested to this world. It's talking about when we come back with the Lord. In our new bodies. Clothed in white. And when we return with him. Then at that point. Christ is going to defeat the armies at Armageddon. He's going to fix up everything that's wrong. He's going to take his, his place as king of the world. In Jerusalem. And after a 75 day period at the end of the tribulation, the millennial kingdom is going to start. And in that millennial kingdom, there is going to be at least to a great extent, if not completely, there's at least to a great extent, there's going to be a reversal of the curse. And there's going to be peace between animals. And there's not going to be the same amount of disease and death as there is now. There will be some. Because... We're not in the new heaven and new earth yet. But it will be greatly reduced. And that's what creation is waiting for. And we talk about creation groaning. Creation is groaning. And people ask you, it, it seems like there's so much cancer around at the minute. And it seems like there's so much dementia and so much Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and, uh, and so many other diseases going around at the minute. Well, yeah, because creation is groaning. Uh, and the, the birth pangs are coming and they're getting more intense and they're getting stronger and they're getting more frequent. Uh, and these things are going to increase more and more as we approach the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And creation is groaning, anticipating that time when it's going to be delivered from the curse. 
And much of it's going to be reversed and things are going to be as they were meant to be. That's something for us to anticipate seeing as well. We're going to leave it behind a bit earlier than the rest. Praise God. But what an anticipation we have. It's great to be saved. And it's great to know what God has in store for us. Let's keep thinking expectantly. And then finally, for this evening, we're to think gratefully. We're to think gratefully. There's one short verse, and it is a short verse. And you won't have too many problems remembering it. But it's in a, a whole list of short verses. Actually, we trivia thing for you concerning the Bible. The shortest verse in the Bible, what is it? Okay. In English. <laughs> In English, it's Jesus wept. But in the Greek, it's verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. It's not a lovely verse to have as the shortest, in the original language at least. A, a verse that even a child can remember. It's one word in the Greek. And it, 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 this whole idea of rejoicing evermore is contained within that one word. And it's just a lovely thought that that shortest verse that the children can remember is all about rejoicing and praising God for all that he has done. Then two verses later, in verse 18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There's a whole lot in that verse. I'm not going to really delve into it in big detail tonight. First of all, in everything. And everything of things. We're reminded last night that whenever Daniel heard the decree that no one was to pray to anyone but the king for 30 days, he came before the Lord and he gave thanks. For a command that could end his life. Because it meant he had an opportunity to glorify God. In everything give thanks. That's tough. I don't do it. I know I should do it. But I should be thanking God for everything. I would hazard a guess, and forgive me if I have underestimated you, but I would hazard a guess that we would all say that we don't give thanks for everything. But it's what we're to aspire to do. And it's what we're to strive to do. It's not something that we just think about and say, oh, I could never do that. I just don't have that mind. Well, actually, we do have that mind because what mind have we been given? We've been given the mind of Christ. Ye have the mind of Christ, we're told. And so we have been given that mind. We can be thankful in all things. Why should we do it? Because this is God's will. You know, people going around all the time saying, how did I discover the will of God? Well, when you've got a verse like this that says, this is the will of God. <laughs> and it's to give thanks for everything. Oh, no, I, I don't think I could do that. I'm not very good at that. G give me something else. Yeah, it's not our response when we say something that is so clear. This is God's will. And if we're not doing God's will in this, or at least if we're not striving to do God's will in this, why should he ask us to do anything else? If we haven't even got the basics. You can be absolutely sure that if God was to lead you into some form of ministry or some service for him or lead you to be a witness to a particular individual, you can be absolutely sure that it's going to be difficult. And if you're not giving thanks in all things, you're going to get very discouraged. And so this is why this is the will of God. This will underpin everything else that we do. We're to think gratefully. But it's the will of God in Christ Jesus. And that's the context of our thanksgiving. We give thanks to God because of what Christ has provided to us. 
Because he has given us eternal life. Because he has promised us heaven. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit as our comforter and our guide. And the one who triggers our conscience on occasions. Because of all of those things that, God has, that Christ has given us and much, much more. We can give thanks, but it's all because of him. So if we give thanks because of what Christ has given, we're returning thanks to Christ. And we're returning thanks to the Father who has given him. And we're returning thanks to the Holy Spirit who has given us understanding of him. Our praise goes to God. And so in everything, we're to give thanks. Think spiritually. Think eternally, think carefully, think patiently, think expectantly, think gratefully. I trust that God will give us those grateful hearts.